Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's AHN uh, Educational uh, Nephrology Webinar. And today's series number 52. So, um, and uh, today's topic will be new concepts in the treatment of uh, anemia in CKD patients uh, with iron deficiency. So um, uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, to, uh, today's speaker, uh, who is very inspirational to some of us, especially some of the nephrologists who work in East Africa, who have uh, who had a, a privilege to be taught by uh, Professor Santos uh, at CMC Vero. So uh, me myself, I spent some time there. And uh, I was privileged to, to get to know him and uh, be taught by him. So our today's pro uh, presenter is Professor Santos uh, Varagiz. Uh, he's the professor of nephrology and head of the department of nephrology at Christian Medical College and the hospital, uh, Vero, uh, India. And uh, Professor Santos has a fellowship in nephrology and transplantation from University of Toronto, Canada. So uh, Professor Santos will be having time to present today. And uh, at the end of his presentation, we'll allow some, uh, some, uh, you to ask some questions or comments. Uh, and for those who are joining us now, you are warmly welcome. And therefore I would like to, uh, to, to welcome Professor Santos uh, for presentation. Professor Santos, you are warmly welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my slides are clear for everyone. Are they clear? Yes, uh, very clear. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's uh, always a pleasure to reconnect with our uh, uh, brothers and sisters across the oceans. So uh, this topic I had taken for another academic session where uh, Dr. Georgie, uh, my mentor, was the chairperson and I was giving the talk. Um, and uh, he said it was very nice. And uh, Dr. Lloyd said, uh, then you must do it for uh, the Friday evening sessions that you all are having. So that's how, the, that's how I agreed to come and present in this one. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for asking me. So I, uh, the topic is very specific. It's iron deficiency anemia and uh, CKD. And as we speak, more and more small, uh, small, small things are being evolved. So uh, it, it may not be co comprehensive, but I have tried to make it as comprehensive as possible. So this is a typical patient that we would have, a 57-year-old lady with diabetic nephropathy with uh, uh, CKD stage 4, 20 ml uh, uh, shortness of breath with minimal pedal edema and pallor. The blood pressure is slightly elevated as a fourth heart sound indicating an LVH, this anemia, with a MCB of 79, <coughs> and EC and echo confirmed the presence of LVH. Now, the uh, default diagnosis is, of course, CKD-related anemia. Uh, and uh, to begin the topic, the WHO definitions have been changed. They still say 13 and 12 for uh, men and women. And when you look at the anemia prevalences, we still take these cutoffs. Although we know now that we don't need to get these targets for everybody. But when we, when we speak of prevalences, we use uh, this definition. Now the prevalence, as we know, increases as the uh, CKD worsens. And in advanced CKD is about 50%. Now, advanced CKD in, includes stages uh, uh, four and five. But we take stage five alone, uh, there, there's at least one estimate which says that one third of the patients may be having anemia. And as we know, it's uh, usually a deficiency of uh, erythropoietin and chronic therapy with erythropoiesis simulating agents is the norm now. And as we know, there are uh, new agents on the horizon some controversy about them, which we not describe, discuss today. And uh, uh, the uh, earlier studies in the, uh, I believe it was in the 90s, which or early 2000s, right? 90s, late 90s, I think, which targeted normal hemoglobin using ESCs 
showed a worse cardiovascular outcome. So now we certainly don't want hemoglobin to be uh, at normal. We just want it just below normal and we have targets which we will discuss. So uh, the problem happens because it's uh, quite often we have concomitant chronic disease anemia or CKD anemia plus iron deficiency anemia. And this might be true positive of iron stores. That is I, uh, absolute iron deficiency anemia or a relative or a functional iron deficiency due to underlying inflammation. So it may be one of the two, both of which lead to iron deficiency anemia. And the inflammation impairs the body's ability to utilize the iron that's sequestered in tissues. This can be a problem because therapy involves giving iron and giving iron causes more sequestration. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. So uh, repletion of iron stores is often necessary in CKD for uh, both treatment of iron deficiency anemia as well as to maximize the ESA efficacy. We know that unless you are also targeting the iron deficiency, the erythropoietin doesn't really work. So coming to the pathophysiology and um, diagnosis and so on, uh, the traditional biomarkers are unreliable. So I'll be describing the biomarkers that are currently available and the sensitivity of, the, of, of them and uh, the pitfalls involved in using just that. Diagnosis and monitoring uh, is therefore difficult. It's important to remember that iron metabolism is tightly regulated at the multiple stages of RBC life cycle. So this is one graph which I'll repeatedly share which has the pathway of iron absorption and utilization. I'll, I'll go across each of these separately. So to, to begin with, the, the iron which we ingest in our diet is absorbed in the gut and bound to soluble transparent. So follow the green uh, boxes which appear. The iron is uh, bound to soluble transparent and then it goes into circulation and it's used for erythropoiesis as well as it is stored in the bone marrow. So uh, the uh, iron in the circulation bound to transparent moves into circulation, storage in the bone marrow used for erythropoiesis. It's then transported to the liver and spleen where it's bound to ferritin for storage for later use. Uh, the erythropoietin when we give, it leads to, and, and, and when it's an RBC production, at the point leads to mobilization of iron stores <clears throat> from the bone marrow. And we have a normal RBCs with adequate amount of heme. The pluripotent myeloid stem cell develops into the RBC. And this process is regulated by the erythropoietin. And the uh, process of, uh, and it's important to remember that the process of conversion of erythroblast to the reticulocytes is iron de de dependent. And therefore, Iron deficiency will therefore limit the responsiveness to erythropoietin. Therefore, if you've got somebody iron deficient, erythropoietin alone may be insufficient. Uh, in, in life, dietary uh, iron is usually sufficient to replace most, most of the daily losses. And a lot of recycling is done by the body itself. Now, there's an important molecule called hepcidin, which you may have seen in the previous diagram. I'll come to the, uh, uh, the effects of hepcidin now. The predominant site of synthesis is the liver and it regulates the uptake of iron from the gut as well as the release of iron from the iron, from the iron stores in the body. Now uh, look at the red uh, box which has hepcidin. As you can see, it has a lot of uh, crosses against what it does. So it uh, decreases the iron uptake from the gut and therefore it reduces iron mobilization as well as it reduces the mobilization into the back from the liver as well as the spleen. So, and uh, uh, so the increased production of hepcidin causes increase in the iron uptake. Sorry, increased production happens when there's iron, iron, increased iron uptake, inflammation, and infection, and vice versa. Now, CKD is associated with increased hepcidin levels. Now, uh, HIF is the thing which has been in the, uh, in the talk of town. It's important for the regulation of erythropoiesin iron metabolism and a key mediator for cell adaptation to oxygen de uh, deprivation. The link to iron is something which I'll show in the next 
uh, picture. So it has an oxygen sensitive alpha subunit, which has got one alpha, two alpha, and three alpha, and a stable eta subunit. It's also important for ion regulation, which is what I'll show in the next picture. So here, the uh, hypoxia induced uh, in, increase in the HEF actually cause a, cause a mul increase in the multiple um, amount number of factors of which both the ferroportin as well as hepcidin are involved. Therefore, HIF is also an iron regulator. This is something which was relatively unknown until a few years ago, that HIF also plays a role in iron regulation. And uh, for those who are more molecularly inclined, there's, uh, there are genes expressed in the duodenum, which I've listed here, <clears throat> which are activated by HIF2, and they increase iron uptake. And HIF signal also control, uh, controls expression of transferrin and transferrin recept receptor. So coming now to diagnosis and uh, usage of biomarkers. So traditional biomarkers for iron deficiency have been uh, hemoglobin itself. People used to say, like, if you got low hemoglobin, it must be iron deficient, especially in developing nations, uh, where uh, countries like India certainly, uh, a lot of people, their normal values of hemoglobin that the pop normal population is uh, not normal and uh, by average standards, and they're all called anemic. The other things are uh, use of hematocrit decolant uh, of hemoglobin, retrocyte count, M MCHC, and MCV. Uh, low MCV being one of the more common tools that we use in our dental practice. Now, absolute iron deficiency anemia using iron uh, studies is there's a decrease in the serum ion, decrease in ferritin, increase in transferrin, and that how we, uh, uh, most labs, I'm not sure how it is in Africa, it is <clears throat> here we have a, a total iron binding capacity, which is transferrin multiplied by a factor, and at, at uh, TSAT or transfer saturation, which is iron by total iron binding capacity. Uh, uh, TSAT as well uh, as well as iron by total iron binding capacity. The values will come to next now. The TSAT less than 20%. Uh, there's um, the KDGO set 30%. Um, I'll come to in the subsequent slide. And ferritin less than or equal to 100. These are not sensitive enough to detect iron deficiency. And that is to say that while if it is this low, yes, there is iron deficiency anemia, but we'll miss a lot of the iron deficiency anemia if we use these cutoffs. So uh, uh, one of the studies uh, showed that if you use these, these indices, you will identify only 17% of the iron deficiency anemia. Whereas if you do a marrow for all of them, half of these patients had iron deficiency anemia. That is to say, somebody with normal iron levels may still have, uh, what do you call it, uh, not so obvious or covert iron deficiency anemia, and they may show increase in hemoglobin if you give them iron, irrespective of iron deficiency. So it is irrespective of isopoietin therapy. So this is a little of a, an eye opener because most of the time we uh, think that if somebody's iron this is a normal, they may not require additional iron. Now, everything has got its negative side as well. So we need to keep that in mind. But we, we must know that these markers are not useful by, uh, by, it, by themselves. The other major limitation is absolute versus functional and if you may, which we discussed. Transfer is increased in both. If a functional and if it's anemia do, exists due to supply and demand mismatch, uh, such as ethropoietin uh, with ethropoietin supplementation, then the iron is stripped from the transferrin faster and it is mobilized and that uh, the TSAT actually can, uh, can drop if we give them only ethropoietin when there's an iron deficiency anemia as well. It's an important factor to consider. So if you see somebody's uh, iron stores decreasing, this might be because there's a functional deficiency which we haven't tackled. So while bone marrow is considered a gold standard for diagnosis, it is frequently done. Uh, if we were to do a marrow for all anemia patients with CKD, the absence of iron, iron fragments would be, a, would be diagnostic of absolute iron deficiency. And absence of 
progenitors, despite adequate iron stores, would be a diagnostic of functional iron deficit anemia. So uh, this might be an exam question, which can be asked uh, in a FIVA. The limitation uh, in using bone marrow, although that is the gold standard, is that there are estimates that up to 30% of the bone marrow samples may be insufficient or inaccurate to make a complete diagnosis. And the more the number of fragments analyzed, the yield changes and the diagnosis may change. And therefore, uh, uh, we may need to get more and more samples. There is no cutoff that is described for uh, 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 how much of a tissue, how much of uh, refine or smear you need to you need to take for making a diagnosis. Then again, it's an invasive procedure and, an ex and, a, and a painful one. And if the patient is not living near the hospital, that's the burden of the cost and travel to the hospital, which has to be borne in addition. And therefore, there's a need for novel bio biomarkers for the iron deficiency anemia, which you will discuss. So now look, let's look at the biomarkers that are there. We look at all of them one by one and look at uh, the reasons for the utility of each of them and why some of them are not very useful. So in uh, uh, our medical literature, serum ferritin is a classical uh, biomarker that's used and targets which we described, discussed earlier of 100 in non-dialysis EKD. And uh, they, a few years ago, said that you can use a cutoff of 200 in patients on dialysis to, for diagnosis. The upper limit of normal is unclear. That is to say, how high uh, ferritin will you accept as being normal? That is not being described at least in CKD literature. So uh, looking at the sensitivity and specificity of the various values, if you use a target of uh, less than 100, the sensitivity is uh, uh, only 35%, sensitivity is 78%. Uh, these are not the same study, therefore the values uh, may not correlate as much. If you use 200, the specificity is, uh, is 100, and the sensitivity only improves marginally. If you use a 500 cutoff, the sensitivity is very good, but the specificity becomes ridiculously low. And we know that the serotonin is an acute phase reactant and may be elevated in CKD irrespective of the ion status. Therefore, <clears throat> with the inflammatory cytokines causing ferritin synthesis. Therefore, uh, it is not useful by itself, especially if the values are not very, very clear. So uh, if the ferritin is low, like less than 100, there is absolute iron deficiency anemia. We could conclude that. But a normal or an elevated serum ferritin, we cannot with any certainty exclude iron deficiency anemia. Coming to TSAT or uh, transferrin saturation, that is uh, iron bound to transferrin by the total body stores, iron by TIBs. A value of uh, 20, less than 20% has got about two thirds sensitivity and 80% specificity. The treatment target is 30 to 50%. So this is where the target was changed to uh, 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 30 uh, 30% in the uh, uh, more recent KDO guidelines. And uh, if the value is less than 30%, they are, the person is likely to respond to IV iron uh, transfusion, uh, infusion in terms of anemia improvement. But the total iron binding capacity, that is the denominator, is affected by inflammation and malnutrition. And that is one inherent problem with using uh, TSAT. The reticulocyte hemoglobin content or the absolute amount of hemoglobin in the circulating reticulocytes available for atropoiesis is another test which has been used in the past. The specificity is very high, 93%, but the sensitivity is low. A low value is predictive uh, of a response to IV ion, and it's supposed to be a more effective marker than using ferritin or TSAT. But there are uh, issues is it is time sensitive to the maturation of reticulocytes. Therefore, it may be an, having an inherent error and it cannot be used in patients with thalassemia where the changes are similar to iron deficiency anemia. The other major problem is it does not reflect iron stores unlike ferritin. 
and there is no treatment target that we have so far. So while we can say if it's low, there is iron deficiency, we don't have a target that we can use. Uh, the concentration of hemoglobin in the RBCs, looking at the available of our hemoglobin for erythropoiesis, good sensitivity and uh, good specificity, and the value is more than 6%, it could uh, predict a response to IVI. The drawbacks are, it's a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a test which must, after collection, you must test within six hours. You cannot keep it for later. And again, it does not reflect iron stores. The soluble transferrin receptor is something which has been studied recently. The transferrin receptor binds a ferric ion and it's uh, uh, internalized and into a complex and it is then shed from the ethroid progenitor membrane. And that is uh, into circulation. That is the uh, soluble transfer receptor that we measure. The sensitivity is, uh, uh, I think, the, uh, 80, 81%. It correlates with the hematological parameters by ethropoietin, but does not detect occult iron deficiency. It is less reliable. And uh, giving erythropoietin itself may cause its rise, and therefore it is now not used at all in the evaluation of iron deficiency anemia. Hepcidin uh, came in very, uh, uh, very people were very excited. Uh, we read about, we heard about its uh, role in iron regulation, and as a uh, marker of iron stores and iron responsiveness, it is considered, and um, it shows it is correlates with ferritin levels. But there's no response, a correlation between hepcidin and iron responsiveness. And therefore, while it uh, does correlate with the ferritin and therefore iron stores, uh, it is not yet in practice as a uh, good tool for iron deficiency anemia estimation. Uh, plasma NCAL, uh, which we know has been used in CKD pro progression, inflammation, urine tract infections in children, acute kidney injury, early diagnosis, and so on also affects the sequestration of iron and therefore people have said, can we look at NGAL? <clears throat> Free NGAL increases extracellular concentration of iron and bound NGAL decreases the extracellular concentration of iron. And uh, if you use a value of 394, uh, low value correlates with PSAT uh, better than using low ferritin values for diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. And it's called recently okay sensitivity but the sensitivity is very poor. And uh, the effect of erythropoietin uh, uh, on the NCAL itself is not known yet. So uh, more research is expected in this area, but the NCAL can be used uh, to diagnose iron deficiency anemia. Right now it is not used in, in a diagnosis, but it may become uh, a useful tool later. Having looked at the markers, uh, now coming to what is therapy. So uh, from the markers, what we understand is we don't have a, one clear cut test that we can use in all patients. And there is no, no even if we were to do bone marrow uh, aspiration and to find biopsy in these patients, we would still miss a considerable number. Therefore, we are left with the tools that we have, and uh, 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 we may get more. Uh, uh, tests in the future for a better diagnosis, but currently our diagnosis is limited by the tools that we have. So coming to optimal management, the uh, KTGO 2012 said, give IVI and if the TSAT is less than 30% and the ferritin less than five, uh, 500, whereas the previous guidelines has said 20, and I believe it was 200 ferritin. The European best practice guidelines uh, stick to 20% uh, and 100, and uh, they say you can go up to 30% and 500 with supplementation. But uh, uh, many CKD patients subsequently were found that they've got an inherent ferritin levels which are high. And therefore, the two most recent guidelines, the RA as well as the National Institute of uh, Health and Excellence, say that you consider increasing the ferritin serine to 800 nanograms. So you can continue to give them IV iron even if the ferritin is on the higher side, because they may have iron deficiency, which is not obvious until we reach 800. So these are two guidelines which now propose a higher guideline, higher level of ferritin. <clears throat> now I'll uh, look at the various drugs that are available. 
some of these are not in common common use now uh, here of these the iron dextran and uh, dextran and the low molecular weight iron dextran i think have gone out of uh, practice because of the side effects and the black box black box warning <clears throat> most commonly used are uh, iron sucrose the uh, uh, ferrimoxitol iron isomaltoside and the ferric carboxy maltose injection uh, in india we have iron sucrose which is largely not used now because we've got uh, ferric carboxy maltose which is uh, most readily av readily available large doses can be given and the other drugs are uh, slowly coming in and uh, these are the studies which i uh, just show of uh, of, <clears throat> of what they've given and uh, uh, what what the effect was so uh, the uh, studies which are named called drive 1 drive 2 showed that giving IV iron <clears throat> improved the ferritin, decreased the erythropoietin requirement without uh, much IV, without much side effects. <clears throat> the uh, uh, pivotal trial used iron sucrose and uh, the revoked trial uh, used iron sucrose versus oral, oral iron. The uh, few other trials which I'll show are those used IV versus oral and shown that the IV ferric maltose is definitely superior to oral iron. This study again showed oral iron versus uh, IV iron. And again, ferric maltose versus iron sucrose. Now the uh, ferric maltose, uh, the advantage is two doses, 15 milligram per kilogram is sufficient versus iron sucrose, which used to be 100 milligrams per dose times 10 doses. In the study used 200 milligrams per dose times five doses. So uh, uh, most people would say that uh, if the transferrin saturation is less than 10%, uh, 20% and or the ferritin is less than 100, they like likely to have an absolute iron deficiency and they like likely to improve with iron supplementation. Uh, those between 20 to 30 percent TSAT and uh, ferritin concentration between 100 and 500 likely will have normal iron stores on bone marrow biopsy. Many, but many will increase the hemoglobin iron supplementation, or you may be able to decrease the dose of ESAs. Therefore, they say that maybe this group is a group which also will benefit from therapy. More than 30 percent uh, TSAT and the ferritin concentration of more than 500, they may not respond to IV iron. However, like I said, two guidelines say that 800 should be the cutoff. And therefore, uh, clinically, our treatment perhaps could be a case-based case basis treatment rather than a one size fits all. If the uh, ferritin is high and the TSAT is low, we must investigate for uh, suspected iron deficiency uh, a chronic iron deficiency like a GI blood loss, but this group also may benefit from IV supply and supplementation. In the non-dialysis CKD, uh, uh, oral iron may be sufficient or you may give IV iron, whereas end-stage kidney disease, that is patients on dialysis, typically we use, their, they uh, best to respond to IV iron. And it also depends on uh, the choice of uh, giving oral versus IV it depends on severity of anemia ability to tolerate the iron, response to prior iron therapy, history of adverse reactions, especially the iron dextran, and uh, availability of I venous access. Now, when you give IV iron, it's caused a rapid repletion of the body stores, especially in patients who don't tolerate oral iron the, or have previous unresponsiveness. They have a good response to IV iron. Oral iron is unlikely to be effective in the following conditions, especially those who have symptomatic anemia or severe iron deficiency. Severe anemia as HP less than seven in asymptomatic patients, ongoing blood loss, uh, and uh, those who have got his side effects to oral iron or previous history of not responding adequately to oral iron, for them, I think it would be futile giving them oral iron therapy. So those who've 
in the past have had a problem with IBIN or didn't uh, did had did had uh, or did not respond, or those with severe iron deficiency or severe anemia or uh, ongoing blood loss, overline probably is not very useful. So, uh, in the management of iron deficiency anemia, our goals of therapy is to correct the absolute iron deficiency anemia, anemia uh, deficiency as well as the get the target hemoglobin. Uh, in general, the consensus is to maintain T sets around 30% and ferritin 500. Although, like I said, people are now moving the goalpost of the ferritin higher. And the dose uh, does vary a bit among individual agents, but the rule of, thia, uh, rule of thumb uh, is about 1000 milligram of elemental iron. And uh, uh, we need to repeat the iron disease a month later. Uh, or after the last uh, uh, last month after the last dose to see what the response has been. Uh, or in those who are getting overline, we can repeat them after three months to see what the response has been. If the patients have not responded adequately with overline, we can uh, give them intravenous iron and uh, then they generally do respond if they've got iron deficiency anemia without an ongoing blood loss. So if they've got... Uh, uh, ongoing blood loss, like a GI blood loss, they will not respond. Uh, the dosing, I'm not sure what are the uh, drugs that are commonly available there. I'll put up a list uh, of what we have here. Uh, we use Orline about 200 milligram per day. Uh, usually that comes to about three pills sometimes, or we can give uh, an alternate day, but typically most people use uh, a single, uh, single dose. One doses typically 65 milligrams of elemental line. The common drugs available are sulfate, humorate, uh, gluconate, whereas the, now the citrate and the sucrophoric oxyhydroxide has come in, which, is, uh, 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 which requires more evaluation, uh, more, uh, 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 more clinical data of, uh, of, of routine use. They should be the drugs should be administered between meals if they are tolerated. Of course, if got if they got if caused GI intolerance, they have to administer it after after food. The intestinal abs iron absorption is impaired, and the absorption of iron is reduced by food and anti antacids. Another alternative for those who don't tolerate taking it between meals is to give them at bedtime. Uh, I must say that although I did put up the alternate day schedule, this has not been studied in CKD. Now these are the uh, drugs and some of the brands as well uh, from this table that I uh, that uh, I found. Intravenous iron, uh, ferrimoxetol, iron sucrose, pericloconate, pericarboxymaltose, and low molecular weight dextrin, of which low molecular weight dextrin is uh, no longer uh, in, used commonly. And uh, if you were to use fer uh, ferrimoxetol, two doses, five hundred and ten milligrams. Administered a week apart, iron to cross 10 doses of 100 or 5 doses of 200, ferric, uh, ferric gluconate, 3 or 4 doses, ferric carboxymaltose, 2 doses of uh, uh, 550, or could even give 2 doses of 500 depending on the body surface area. Uh, iron isomaltoside, now called uh, derisomaltose, 20 milligram uh, per kilogram, and uh, uh, single 1000 milligram is approved in most countries. Canada's got a higher approval of 1,500 milligrams. I have not used this drug, but I, I understand that in many of the trials, it's a very uh, useful drug. Low molecular weight dextran is uh, not a preferred drug, and therefore, uh, the, uh, because of high risk of anaphylaxis, I just put up to complete the picture. Uh, ferric citrate is coming up as a normal ion therapy, as an oral preparation, perhaps some more physiological regulation of ion therapy. It came into the market as a iron uh, as a phosphate binder, but now has been approved for treatment of iron deficiency anemia, and therefore it's appealing that you could treat with a lower pill burden, potentially less side effects of iron overload. So this is something which we could start using for iron as well as phosphate binding. Although we must say that it's not very not a very powerful phosphate binder as compared to the other phosphate binders, so we may not be able to replace it immediately. Ferric maltol is another uh, 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 drug which is coming out for rapid correction of uh, anemia. Again, an oral preparation, 
and the phase three trial has been completed, which shows that there's good improvement of iron and iron indices and is well tolerated. So the less side effects makes this again be attractive. We wait for it to come. As you can see, it's just been published on uh, online. We don't have it in the market yet. Ferric uh, pyrophosphate citrate was approved uh, to give via the dialysate. Uh, now that donates iron directly to the transfer, not used it personally. The studies uh, look impressive, uh, but some of the studies that are available are old studies and probably can uh, need to wait for more trials to show its usefulness. But what has been shown is that when you give the drug in the dialysate, the requirement of erythropoietin also comes down. Therefore, the drug definitely works and without required, uh, being required to be given separately, it may be something that can be thought about as a, as an, as a treatment option. Liposomal or sucrosomal iron is something which uh, is coming, is being available in the market now of uh, the ferric pyro, uh, pyrophosphate core being surrounded by uh, either a phospholipid layer or a sucrosomes layer. The uh, advantage is that the uh, GIT is bypassed and therefore the GI side effects are less and the uh, down regulating effects of hepcidin on iron, iron absorption from the gut is also less. And therefore this is again, uh, quite attractive and uh, there are some uh, studies which show that the rise in hemoglobin is similar to iron sucrose and uh, therefore it's something that can be uh, tried. Uh, the only problem is it's quite expensive. It improves iron deficient anemia not only in CKD but in many other conditions. Concurrent iron deficient anemia is, is uh, treated successfully using liposomal iron. So to conclude, uh, iron deficiency is a common and treatable cause of anemia in CKD, but uh, we mustn't forget other conditions which we face, including hemolysis, antibodies to erythropoietin, which is not so common now, hyperparathyroidism, resistant to erythropoietin, which is very difficult to diagnose because we don't have a exact test for it. We are limited by what we have, with the TSAT and ferritin is what we commonly have. There are other uh, biomarkers that I described. All of them have got their pitfalls, especially in borderline values. If the values are clear cut, uh, showing low iron, iron values, uh, we, know, we don't have an issue. But then the usefulness happens is, is when we can't use TSAT or ferritin, uh, or rather the TSAT and ferritin are inconclusive. When we treat, we need to a balance the benefits of the iron in avoiding or minimizing blood transfusions and erythropoietin requirement anemia related symptoms versus potential risks of iron therapy. If you look at some of the studies which looked at MRI of the heart and of the liver in CKD patients, they've all shown the uh, disadvantage of iron uh, transfusion and iron infusions that they've got iron overload states uh, being demonstrated uh, conclusively. So while on the one hand we improve the patient's quality of life, improve any uh, improve health, we don't really know that don't know the downside of giving them pumping in the IV ion to the heart and the liver. More data in the future will show. There are multiple established agents, oral and IV formulations, and uh, usage is as feasible. New therapies are becoming available. So this is a summary slide of some of the things that I said about. Uh, what happens in anemia of chronic disease. Uh, uh, this table can, uh, uh, can adds, has the uh, ESA related problem as well as the, and the therapy with the uh, HIF alpha inhibitors as well as the causes and effects. So HIF alpha inhibitors have run, run into some uh, roadblock in terms of their uh, uh, licensing by FDA because of some side effects. Otherwise, it was supposed to have taken over the world by storm uh, sometime early this year. Thank you for your patient listening. I'm open for trying to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you again. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Santosh. That was excellent presentation. And uh, you have highlighted um, a very important topic uh, in nephrology, which is uh, iron deficiency anemia. So, Professor Santosh, um, 
uh, it's a question time, and I would like to start uh, by asking you uh, some of the questions. Um, so, uh, uh, Professor, uh, in an, uh, I, we have seen cases of anemia uh, in our area where you, the, you, you evaluate the patient uh, and you find that, you know, she has iron deficiency anemia, but you try to give EPO, uh, the normal dose of 4 Southern International Unit, uh, and, and then uh, iron sucrose as well. But yet, uh, patients uh, doesn't improve. Uh, so can we uh, uh, double the dose of EPO? For example, uh, instead of uh, giving 4,000, can you go up to, um, I mean, uh, can you go up to uh, 8,000 international units of EPO and then give it for at least uh, uh, until the, the HB is, is normalized? Uh, so hi, th so thank you for the question. So basically what you're saying is you've got somebody with uh, iron deficiency anemia, you've yes. treated the iron deficiency anemia, you're giving regular dose of erythropoietin. Can we go yes. up on the dose of erythropoietin? So exactly, the dose yeah. of erythropoietin uh, is, a, if my memory serves you right, is 50 to 150 units per kilogram uh, uh -huh. is the dose. Okay. So yes, we can. Uh, and uh, I don't know, do you have drugs like dabapoietin available uh, there? Yeah, yes, but uh, expensive and uh, expensive, not no, yeah. yeah, because yeah, it's, but... it, diapoietin we find is actually very, very uh, improves hemoglobin quite rapidly if we give them once a week. But yes, yes, we can double or uh, at least give one and a half times and uh, mm. uh, three times a week, one, like 4,000, instead of 4,000, you can give 6,000 units of three times a week and uh, see the, see what the hemoglobin response is. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, any other question from audience? Uh, Santosh, one question. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yes. You know, see, sometimes we, we can't do these mark, biomarkers, Santosh. See, that's the big problem that we have. For example, you know, I think Dr. Narendra is in the audience, and I think he's, he's, he's done a wonderful job. You know, sometimes you can only get, some of them can do ferritin. Okay, And the, 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 the problem is twofold. One is the cost. Okay, there's no reimbursement maybe in certain regions. And second is, you see, the test itself in the lab is not possible to do. You see, we have restricted that way. So, for example, now, now I think this is Dr. Narendra, actually, in uh, Rwanda, what he did was, he, he said, okay, less than 200 ferritin, I will uh, bolus them and give and load them with iron, you know, and between 200 to 700, I'll give them a maintenance dose a month. Okay, uh, and more than 700, I will do a CRP to see the inflammation and then decide what I have to give or see if there's inflammation and then, you know, decide and give. So this is this is one of the strategies that Narendra has been actually following. Yeah. I think he's in the audience. Uh, uh, Dr. Narendra, if you're there, please go on. And and, and I think it, it has been working. I mean, it, this is in one area. But, you know, resource limitations are major problems. You see, that, that that's just to highlight this. What are your comments? Uh, I, that that certainly sounds in innovative. Thank you. I'd like to hear the complete details, but that sounds really good because... Um, our problem with the high ferritin is that we don't know if there's inflammation. Uh, I'm not sure if the CRP will highlight all the inflammation there is, but definitely it's better than not doing anything. Uh, in clinical practice, um, uh, MCV is something that uh, I think we can uh, easily rely on if it's uh, if it's on the at least if it's on the low normal or low side that we can give them IV iron and load them. But please tell me more about the, about the technique of uh, treatment. It sounds very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, put Dr. Uh, this, yeah, Dr. This Narendra, come on. From yes, Dr. Narendra, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Satosh. Uh, you have highlighted uh, some of, uh, you know, in fact, very important issues concerning um, you know, treatment of, of, of iron deficiency. But I think, um, I would, have, I would have been more glad if you had also mentioned the cautions, the, the caution that one should do exercise while you're administering iron. Because do, do, don't forget iron is, um, it, it, it actually, I mean, it, it, if, if you remember the, the, the Finton reaction, actually, it, you know, with the um, consumption of, uh, of electrons, actually, in the system, it tends to raise the oxidative stress in the plasma and therefore is likely to actually to spark off inflammation. And this is what, uh, what you observe 
in patients who have ovarian overload and who have got hemochromatosis. That's one. Two, I think I, I wish you could also comment on, on, on iron as food for bacteria, especially on patients on patients on dialysis. Now that is why I think, as as Lloyd has has told you, I you know uh, um, I tend to have caution. You know, we have two things: we are administering double protein. We, either, we here we here we use double protein as the as, as the main uh, you know, replacement therapy in, in in patients on dialysis. So we we, we use double protein. Now it is it, it is very expensive. I mean, erythropoietin splitting agents are very expensive, and um, you, uh, you know, compared to compared to to, to, to the iron sucrose. So uh, I take that one as what I call, what I could call the main effort. If you administer like these patients, uh, and, and, and therefore to do that, you, these patients must must be adequately loaded with iron. So I, um, while you know. Patients with um, iron less than 200, uh, you know, uh, yeah, 200 nanograms per ml. I mean, ferritin less than 200 nanograms per ml. I, I I prefer to to load them, and, and in fact, you know, some data indicate that you shouldn't exceed more than 300 mg, uh, more than 400 milligrams per per month. So I give them weekly. Um, and, uh, and then when, when, when the ferritin goes above 200 milligrams, then I can give, put on maintenance and usually it works when I give like two, two per month. But of course, when, when, when the ferritin exceeds, I mean, I, I get a cutoff of 600. Uh, maybe I could, I, I could go up to 800 like we have advised it. Yeah. So we, we have this, you, you, you are hanging between giving a, a large dose, I mean, a very expensive drug like adapoquetin with less iron, with inadequate iron loading, and therefore it won't be effective. So I prefer, that's why I prefer, to, that's why I prefer to load them. But on the other hand, uh, I, I get scared having to, to have somebody, you know, overload. In fact, I had an experience, patient was being followed up, uh, Outside, outside, uh, outside my unit, uh, uh, case of CKD. And when he came, he, he was actually iron overloaded. And when I started him on iron for you, I mean, when I started him, I started him on dialysis. I realized his ferritin was actually over two thousand, and I stopped it. And he actually developed massive ascites, and ultrasound suggested he was having uh, was having cirrhosis. So I. I stopped iron. In fact, he's been on dialysis for like you know more than one year. It's only lately when I realized that his um, his ferritin has, has had dropped to uh, like to eight hundred, and actually his uh, his ascites. I was actually having to to tap it every two weeks, but now I haven't tapped it for the last six months. So I now. So we, 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 the, the question is, okay, somebody should, should you know, you should, you should load these patients, you know, have adequate time loading for these patients for the very expensive drug, I mean, like, like patent splitting agents to be effective because, I mean, here the, the iron, iron, 100, iron sucrose 100 milligrams, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's only 6,000 compared to the patent, which is 40,000 a vial. So in so in, in in that case, it, it it's a question of weighing toxicity of iron uh, uh, against ineffectiveness of the operating that we might have to use. Now I have actually realized actually, in, in I, I may I might be wrong. I might be wrong because I have seen those patients that you, you have overshot and uh, they have got to you know uh, um, iron that is beyond uh, one thousand. I mean treating that's beyond one thousand. I have realized actually they have poor response. To the operating, I have got two patients uh, who are overshot and, and they are not responding well to. They are not responding well to the operating. They are slowly. They are, they are responding slowly. So I think there is, a, and just like you've mentioned, you know, hepcidin, which brings about an element of inflammation and therefore, you know, release away from the stores. I, I think when when you when you overshoot, there is a risk. It's something. I mean, maybe some studies to do on. 
when you overshoot with uh, with iron loading, you probably bring in some inflammation and uh, you, you introduce some some kind of erythropoietin splitting agent resistance. I think that, that's my my suspicion. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarindwa. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Santosh, do you have any comment on, on that? Uh, 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 Dr. Lloyd was saying about uh, using CRP as a, as a cutoff for uh, knowing whether they've got inflammation or not. Uh, uh, do you have a cutoff for CR of the CRP that you use for these patients? No, no, I th no it's, it, it's okay. You know, you, you have somebody with, um, you, you have somebody with, uh, you know, ferritin, say that that's 1,000. And I have also seen it. In, in, in some now and and you, you find that probably uh, there may there, there may be no there, there may be no good reason for for this patient for this patient being overloaded so i mean and like you mentioned you know ferritin is an acute phase reactor so in this particular case i mean this is actually what it's, it's not my personal experience this is what we are doing in, in uh, when i was in the training under professor naika professor sarah naika so you know, if if the ferritin is very high, then you, are, you you have to exclude inflammation. So if you do the CRP, that's above normal. Here we use the, the cutoff of six. Uh, if 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 the CRP is 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 above is is high is, is above normal, um, and 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 the ferritin is also high. That brings about a suspicion of you know systemic inflammation. Therefore, you know the, the, the elevated uh, ferritin could be just an acute phase reactant. So in that case, uh, you look for what is causing this inflammation, and uh, maybe you deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, Professor Santos. Uh, hi. And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think he was commenting about uh, ferritin. Yeah, uh, yeah. Using using yes. higher cutoffs of ferritin, but being watchful about overload and of or uh, uh, of, uh, inf of inflammation. So, I think uh, we'll have we'll have to play around with, uh, especially when the values are borderline. It's a it may be a tricky call, and uh, we'll have to take a judgment on whether it is safe to give I iron or. Uh, it's unsafe to give. Uh, we should first our first rule of medicine is do no harm. So it can be very tricky at times. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Exactly. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, there are cases that are not actually to raise ferritin. I mean, so if somebody has sepsis, ferritin is very very high, or, or if the patient has got acute HIV infection, so you know, ferritin is actually high. No, not necessarily indicating, uh, not necessarily indicating uh, 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 iron overload. So in, in in that case, of course, if if in in, in such a situation, the ferritin is high, the CRP is also high. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good explanation, Doctor Tarindo. Um, can uh, any other question? I've seen Doctor Francis, uh, who is also your student, uh, Professor um, Santosh. I think you told him what. Yeah. Yes. So there's something in the chat box asking about. Uh, uh, I think I'll just. Uh, yeah. So uh, what is the role of newer uh, biomarkers like reticulocyte hemoglobin content and hepcidin? Hepcidin is not uh, being currently used. Reticulocyte hemoglobin content I had actually put in the presentation. So uh, I'll send the presentation over to Dr. Lloyd, and uh, uh, I think that can be shared among in the in the in the group. Uh, yes, sure. they all the when the uh, the rule of thumb is when the values are uh, low or uh, high, depending on what we uh, where we are looking at, where where the diagnosis is clear, there is no doubt. But where the diagnosis is suspect, we still don't have a very effective uh, marker. So each bit each bit adds uh, adds a bit. That's all. Uh, is blood transfusion counterproductive in CKD? I, I think uh, since more and more people, we would. Uh, we would ask that they go for transplantation. We want to avoid uh, giving blood unless they are symptomatic, or if there's a uh, there's a they are going to undergo a procedure where you need to keep uh, where there's a, where there's a bleeding possibility. 
uh, 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 we use uh, leuco leuco reduced or leuco depleted uh, blood cells uh, or rbcs for transfusion where we have to absolutely use it and in addition we use wbc filter i'm not certain if these are uh, universally available uh, but in general blood transfusion uh, uh, can generate antibodies uh, and uh, may therefore make transplant in the future difficult so uh, the rule of thumb is not to use blood transfusion uh, the uh, I, there was a there was an old concept of uh, using the same uh, donor specific transfusions uh, before transplant uh, which is actually uh, not being commonly used now uh the question is on on how practical is use of uh, oral iron to correct iron deficiency anemia uh, it's pretty uh, useful uh, in patients who have who've got uh, who are who've got ckd but not on dialysis on dialysis uh, uh, oral iron is not that effective it is not to say that it doesn't work at all but uh, it's uh, the absorption will be much poorer and the uh, requirement will be much larger therefore it's easier to give them iv iron uh, having said all this i must say that we don't use iv iron all that commonly uh, uh, but we do use oral iron especially in early ckd uh, therefore the iron iron indices then they, they become reasonably all right and we can come and continue i erythropoietin and use iv iron only as required uh, the uh, next question is comment on use of uh, uh, yeah iron preparations and esas in setting of infections uh, so that's a that's a uh, that's a problem you know when we have infections and inflammation all, all these are double edged swords uh, there was a there was a worry about using erythropoietin in setting of malignancies and that's gone uh, up and down uh, people uh, should use it i would say uh, large doses may be counterproductive using esas uh, using lower doses just to manage so that they are not symptomatic maybe still all right the other thing is about using esas and uh, second point about uses esas in high bp so uh, some of the studies showed uh, hypertension uh, uh, hypertension and strokes with dalpoitin so i think people who blood pressures are uncontrolled would be very careful about giving them uh, esas especially the long acting ones the short acting ones may be therefore safer uh, erythropoietin may be safer than dalpoitin in uh, people with uncontrolled hypertension but that's just a thought i'm not very certain this one question is uh, mcd of 72 ferritin of 3000 would you give iron it's a very good question i don't know the answer it is likely that the ferritin in this 3000 range is a Is, a, is because of an acute phase reactant response due to inflammation. I think uh, we should see whether there's some occult inflammation going on. But the MCV of seventy two definitely is on the lower side and suggests IV iron. And therefore, if the inflammation uh, comes down or can be controlled, or we can correlate with CRP as we heard, and we can give the iron. But I certainly I would like to avoid it when the when there's ongoing inflammation. comment on the dr lloyd has posted comment on the use of iron preparation in setting and uh, yeah so uh, it's not a strict no no but uh, we would like to have the infection controlled or at least the big at least some 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 control uh, before we give the iron and esas and again the same question is about yeah i think the copy the same question in here uh a, a hemoglobin of 10 would you give iron first and then or give iron plus erythropoietin together so uh, i'm not sure which is a reference but uh, i believe there was one reference which say used a cut off of 10.5 uh for giving uh giving if it's less than 10.5 to give them erythropoietin therefore if they've got uh, uh features suggestive that But they don't have iron deficiency anemia, then we can give them just erythropoietin. Uh, but if they've got features suggestive of iron deficiency anemia, we should give them IV or lower IV iron, and then give them erythropoietin. So it depends on uh, whether they. Uh, oh, sorry. 
the, I misread the question. In digestive deficiency anemia, you would give iron first and then give the erythropoietin. Yes, I would give iron first and then the erythropoietin. I miss seeing the iron deficiency anemia part. Sorry. Yeah, I think these are the only questions that are here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Santosh. Um, any other question? Last one <laughs> uh, or comment? Um, well, uh, uh, if the... Santosh, I, okay. I think uh, can you comment? Because uh, can you comment on um, because theoretically they say iron is is good for uh, for bacteria theoretically, but I had I haven't seen any data, especially in particular patients on dialysis. Which say that um, um, which indicate that patients, you know, who who, you, who are using iron probably more than the others tend to have, uh, you know, infection like catheter infections compared to those that uh, are, uh, are not using that much of iron. Maybe because it is very difficult actually to put some patients off iron, and I mean, it would be unethical. So, I, I, in, is has it been proven by data actually that? Uh, you know, uh, the, the you, iron uh, use of iron in dialysis patients, for, for instance, would increase the rate of infections. So, uh, uh, while preparing for this, I looked at uh, I, I, iron, uh, iron IV and oral and dialysis and non-dialysis CKD. And there is no date. There is always a soft mention that we must be careful if there's ongoing inflammation infection. But that IV iron concomitant use in dialysis patient increases the risk of infection if they've got a catheter in them, like if they've got a, a tunnel dialysis, hemodialysis catheter, or they've got a peritoneal dialysis catheter. Uh, I haven't seen any reference of these. I think they're, they're definitely uh, theoretical, and in some cases, they might be occurring, but uh, I certainly haven't read any of these things in, in, in hard all right, uh, Dr. Santosh, thank you very much. And um, if there's no any other comment or question, uh, we have come to an end of uh, today's presentation. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Santosh for taking time preparing this presentation, which was very, very useful and very, very important. Uh, and therefore I would also like to thank Dr. Lloyd uh, for working tirelessly to make sure that this session is successful. Uh, thank AHN and also thank everyone who attended this session. Dr. Santos, thank you very much. Yeah.